Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Geller, and I am the um, one of the co-chairs for the Intercultural Directions Council, which is sponsoring um, today's series. And I just want to welcome you. Um, first of all, I apologize. There's a little confusion about the space. Um, we, we saw Gretzky and immediately thought Upper Gretzky, but it's really the Gretzky Theater. So, um, so there'll be some other people arriving. <clears throat> Um, this is the third in a series of lessons from Charlottesville through a critical lens. Today we're going to be looking at public memory, how monuments reflect our shared history. Um, on um, October 11th, next week, we're going to be looking at fake news and echo chambers. How can we stop the spiral? And that is at 4.30 in Gretzky, <laughs> Upper Gretzky. And then the last one we have is actually going to be more interactive than the last four panels have been. We're going to be looking at envisioning our country and campus anew. And um, we're going to be talking about how do we move forward with hope, courage, and compassion. Um, and so we hope that you're able to continue to join us as we complete the, next, um, the last two of the entire series. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kyle Lingard, and he'll introduce today's panel. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, yeah, so thank, thank you to Mary Geller um, and, the, and the rest of the IDC for um, helping to organize these with me. Um, we, we really wanted to be proactive after uh, the events at Charlottesville around the removal of a, a statue there, and that was really what, what uh, inspired us to to say, okay, what, what can we do? We know these sorts of things could happen here just as easily as at the University of Virginia. So we wanted to uh, kind of get out in front and, and be proactive, as I said. And today's, um, today's event is maybe most directly linked to, to Charlottesville because we're gonna be talking a lot about um, public memory and, and how monuments reflect our shared history. Um, I wanted um, in organizing this panel to make sure we are looking at um, monuments from a variety of perspectives. That's always very important, but um, I wanted to also look at it from a variety of disciplinary perspectives. And so um, today, uh, Shannon Smith from the History Department will be starting us. Um, I'll, I'll go second. I'm the director of the Writing Center, um, the FYS program, and I also work with environmental studies. Um, Jim Reed from the Politics Department will be talking. Third, um, Carol Brash from uh, the Art Department, she's an art historian, will talk fourth. And Nicole Hurt, who is in the Communication Department, will conclude. Each of the five of us will speak for approximately seven minutes. Um, it's gonna be tough, but we're gonna do it. And um, that will take us a little over halfway for our time together, and then we're gonna have a, a chance for the audience to ask the panel questions and to maybe have a little bit of a discussion so that we can make sure everybody has a chance to uh, get what they want to from this uh, from this panel today. So again, thank you for coming and I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Smith um, who will talk on memory history in the past. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thanks for everybody for coming this afternoon. We are actually starting with the Civil War. Uh, this is what historians do. So uh, during and in the aftermath of the Civil War, African Americans immediately went to work to celebrate emancipation, to commemorate the dead, and to shape the public meaning of the war. And the events in Charlottesville are very much about the public meaning of the war and thereafter. On January 1st, 1863, African Americans gathered in Port Royal, South Carolina, in honor of the Emancipation Proclamation. Even as the war raged on to make that emancipation a reality for four million enslaved people. The first black regiment in the Union Army gathered, and the former slaves spontaneously started singing America. One white officer wrote that this spontaneous outburst of love and loyalty to a country that has so terribly wronged them was the birth of a new hope. At the presentation of the flag, black soldiers said that they would die before surrendering the flag. Corporal Robert Sutton commended his fellow soldiers that none of them would rest while their families remained in chains. 
he urged the regiment that they must take that flag and show it to Jefferson Davis in Richmond. Black soldiers used celebrations like this to articulate a vision of practical freedom for themselves and for the entire black community. This was a chance to fight against their enslavers. It was a chance to fight to free their families. And one day, perhaps, this also meant that they would gain respect and citizenship in the country. Today, I want to pose some questions about why many African-American commemorative celebrations like this are less remembered, while monuments to Robert E. Lee and other leaders of the Old South continue to shape our public landscape and tell a particular version of our nation's past. Statues themselves are not history but they're one way of telling stories about the past. These stories were created at a specific time to meet specific social, economic, and political needs. They give the illusion of consensus of civic values. They mask debates that are often taking place, and they solidify in public space a particular version of the past. Memories like this, and as we've seen, statues, <laughs> can have very powerful cultural and emotional attachments and are the way most Americans make sense of the past and of the present. Things to think about today. First, who controls public space? Who controls which stories about the past are told in public space? How are these stories told? What does it look like to tell a story about the past? And how does that differ depending on who is doing it? And third, how do communities create meaningful histories or a usable past to help make sense of the present for themselves? During the Civil War and Reconstruction, African Americans were not trying to tell stories in stone or marble. They had other things to do. They were trying to reunite their families. They were trying to buy land, establish households, negotiate fair labor contracts, get an education, find safety for themselves and their families, establish churches. They had other things to do rather than erect monuments. Instead, they tended to use much more ephemeral or short-lived forms of celebration that really emphasized the importance of community. So one way they did this was through parades. Parades were often held and a great thing about parades is that people can read multiple meanings into them. You can emphasize particular groups within a parade. Uh, African Americans had speaking tours. They held conventions. They had fun fairs and pageants and fundraisers to celebrate the past. They hosted industrial expositions to demonstrate their contributions in education, in the arts, in industry, in various professions. They created new holidays like the Emancipation Day, Juneteenth, or the celebration of abolition in various places. They even created things like lithographs that they could commemorate the past while hanging it in their homes. This uh, lithograph is telling a story of both the past and the future, what enslaved people had come out of, uh, and what they were aiming for. So even along the bottom, we see education, we see legalized marriage, we see the ballot box, we see churches. So telling the story of both the past and the future. It's not that African Americans didn't see a need for monuments, they just wanted to use their time and money for other things. And often it was about control of public space. So if white committees, white city councils controlled public space, it was often very hard to erect monuments. They did use monuments, existing monuments, however. On the 4th of July in 1866, black Charlestonians took over Capitol Square, a space that had previously been off limits to them as black citizens, or not citizens. Uh, they decorated statues of Washington and, and Jefferson with garlands and flags. And they claimed the Founding Fathers as their own. They claimed their right to public space and to full participation in the country. Because white Charlestonians could control that space, however, most white people in town just went to the country for the day. They had the power to ignore its celebrations like this. In contrast to these important celebrations, which create a usable past, 
for African Americans, it was only a matter of time before white Southerners tried to reassert their control of public space and their stories of the past. In 1890, at the dedication of a monument to Robert E. Lee on Monument Avenue in Virginia, there were about 100 to 150,000 people present. Uh, the statue of Lee itself is 14 feet tall. The entire monument is over six stories tall. So talk about claiming public space. This is where they were doing it. It's in a, a prominent neighborhood, an affluent neighborhood, uh, and it tells a story of authority in public space. The few black members of Richmond City Council at the time voted against any funding for the monument or the celebration, but they were outvoted on the council. John Mitchell, one of the council members and the editor of the Richmond Planet, criticized the story of the past that monuments like this would tell in Richmond. He argued that the capital of the late Confederacy has been decorated with emblems of the lost cause. The Lee statue hands down a legacy of treason and blood to future generations. Most importantly, Mitchell noted the black workers who, out of necessity to make a living, were part of the process of installing the, mon the monument. Black men, according to Mitchell, put up the Lee Monument, and should the time come, will be there to take it down. And that is the moment we are at now. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Shannon. That was, I'm, al I'm already like re reimagining what I'm going to say right now. But um, what I wanted to start with was also the Civil War. Um, uh, monuments and memorializing uh, America um, were immediately at the, before the Civil War was even completely ended, Congress and President Lincoln knew that there was a necessity to bring the country together somehow. And um, one of the things they decided to do was invite all states to send two statues to Washington, D.C. and the National Statue of Ohio. Uh, well, and the, and the Statue of Ohio is part of the, of the bill as well. So the idea was every state would be represented and it would be up to the states to decide who, who best represented um, civic leaders uh, or military of, of that state. So the bill reads, the president is hereby authorized to invite each and all of the states to provide and furnish statues in marble or bronze, not exceeding two in number for each state of deceased persons who have been citizens thereof, illustrious for historic renown or distinguished civic or military services. And, um, and so it took some time because a lot of the times they wanted to um, honor people who were still alive, so they had to wait for them to not be alive. Um, but actually, even though it started in 1864, right, there's still many states that haven't yet become states. Um, but it actually took until 2005 for the Statuary Hall to be complete. Um, eventually, they realized the these marble and bronze statues each weighed thousands of pounds. They needed to spread them around the U.S. Capitol. So they're actually in three locations, but um, about about 35 are in the Statue Hall itself. Um, and, and I wanted to talk about one statue the, in particular. This is the 99th statue to be dedicated. In, and this was in 2005. The 100th was New Mexico's Pope, also in 2005. So the final two statues to be added were, were both um, Native peoples, uh, Sarah Winnemucca is a uh, Paiute. And um, I keep thinking about what Shannon said about the illusion uh, of consensus and, the, and what it takes to build consensus, it's, even if it is an illusion. So Sarah Winnemucca um, was, was not recently deceased. She was actually born in about 1844. We don't actually know the day because um, that was the same year General Fremont passed by Pyramid Lake. So she was actually part of the final tribe to be so-called contacted. 
Um, she lived uh, in Carson Valley, Virginia City in 1864 during the Civil War. And when, when the Statue Hall was uh, created, she was giving performances in places like Virginia City, Nevada, and San Francisco, California, depicting things like um, John Smith and Pocahontas. Um, she eventually um, became an activist for the Paiute, um, going to the East Coast. She met with President Rutherford B. Hayes and Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, trying to get, get her people back to Nevada. They had to do their own um, sort of trail of tears uh, to go to Oregon in the middle of the winter. Um, she wrote the first autobiography by a, a Native American, and she also uh, opened a school near Lovelock, Nevada. So she's known as, as a writer and an educator and an activist. She died in 1891. So it, it took um, over 100 years from when she died to when her statue was dedicated. And Nevada um, became a state in 1864 as well. Um, or, yeah, I think 1864. All right, thanks. Um, the first time anybody wanted to have the statue was in 1908. The Federated Indian Women's Club s approached the um, state government in, in Nevada and said, hey, how about, how about we do this statue? Um, it didn't happen very fast. Um, and actually, school teachers in Reno were instrumental in the 1990s to with letter writing campaigns with their elementary school children to get this to go. So it's a little bit different um from from a lot of the other statues and the way it was created um the statue itself um was created by a college student Benjamin Victor who won a national competition to be the artist so when he did this he was in his uh, early 20s um you can see some of the choices he made it's a it's a beautiful statue which is partly why I like talking about it it rem it's reminiscent of the statue of liberty um, there's kind of this helix-like shape. She appears as if she's walking as the bronze fringes in her uh, costume are, are kind of blowing in the wind. Um, she's holding aloft a flower, which refers to her name, uh, Thakmatoni, a uh, shell flower. She's holding her book in her hand as a, as a teacher and a writer. And, um, and, and so I, I just think it's a, it's a really great story. And even at the dedication in 2005, um, this was at a time when the Nevada was um, mostly a Republican state. There are lots of Republicans there. Um, Nancy Pelosi also spoke as, as Speaker of the House. And she said, uh, quote, Congress recognized that even at a time of such division, there was more that united us as a nation than that what divided us. Sarah Winnemucca recognized that too. Um, Another speaker at the dedication was uh, Ralph Burns, who's a Paiute storyteller from Pyramid Lake, and he, he spoke in, in Paiute, so nobody could understand him, and he kind of made fun of some of this, and he said, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're, we're glad she's here. Um, but the story goes, if you go to the small town in, Lake, in Pyramid Lake, and you yell out, Sarah Winnemucca, like one half of the, one side of the road will throw flowers at you, and the other half will throw rocks, so. Um, it, it's, it's always more complicated than you think. Um, things, things have changed a little bit um, since 2005, um, but I wanted to point out for the context of today that there are actually um, 12 statues that uh, depict Confederates in the uh, Statuary Hall, and um, that is 12, 12 more statues than there are African Americans in the Statuary Hall. So. Um, so it's great that we have somebody like Sarah Winnemucca, but um, the Statuary Hall is, is um, not exactly a reflection of um, the diversity of the nation. Um, there are nine, nine women, uh, five Native Americans, and the, virtually all the rest are, are, are white men. Uh, most of those statues are not nearly as um, dynamic. Um, so here's two more statues I wanted to talk about quickly. And um, one of the interesting things that you can do as of the year 2000, you can actually replace statues. Um, a bill was introduced, and a couple have been replaced. So for, and one of them was in Alabama. Um, J.L.M. Curry had his statue removed, and he's, he's now um, at Sanford University, um, where he was one of the early presidents. But Helen Keller is uh, 
who Alabama sent in 2009 to replace uh, that Confederate statue. So Alabama now only has one Confederate. Um, and on the right is, is just another, um, is Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, and that one in much earlier, 1931, which is more typical. And it's also a more typical style, um, which is more uh, upright, uh, less, less of a story being told there in terms of uh, the way Helen Keller is depicted here as learning what water was uh, by having water from the well on her hand. Um, so, we, so I don't know exactly what the future will hold for the Statuary Hall. There are a couple more um, statues that are likely to be replaced. Um, Virginia is, is replacing a white supremacist who's in the, in the hall, uh, thanks to Senator Burr. And Florida is also in the process of replacing uh, one of the, their Confederate statues. So there, are, there is changes, but I, uh, I'm not quite sure what will happen. But it's a, a fascinating site, and that's why I wanted to talk about it today, because you can really see how, um, how various processes work and how um, various people can, can make a difference in the symbolic uh, representation of, of their state and its, and its representatives to the, to the Capitol. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, public history and public memory in the context of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, this, this past August, mid-August. Um, I'm not going to talk at length about the, the protest and the counter-protest itself, other than to highly recommend a documentary, that you, HBO documentary that you can get on YouTube called Charlottesville Race and Terror. This documentary makes absolutely clear that the white supremacist marchers in Charlottesville were not peaceful. They were heavily armed. They were itching for any pretext to attack and even kill the counter protesters. It's also clear from the documentary the extent to which the um, white supremacists who descended on Charlottesville were driven by genuinely neo-Nazi ideology. Um, and uh, how much traction that, that neo-Nazi ideology was getting from a number of millennial age white males. So um, the first, okay, click here. Um, yeah, let me get this. Okay, this is the um, uh, Robert E. Lee uh, statue in Charlottesville pre-demonstration. Uh, this statue went up in 1924, I'll come back to that. Uh, the, the next slide I want to show you is the white supremacist marchers in front of that statue. You see Confederate flags, but something you also see, this flag here is partly United, the, uh, part of the United States flag over here, but there's a symbol in the middle that's actually derived from the SS, a Nazi uh, organization. And you see it says NSM, that stands for National Socialist Movement. So this was uh, genuinely a, a, a uh, neo-Nazi uh, movement, uh, neo-Nazi and, and Ku Klux Klan. Now, when you hear about stories about uh, people proposing to remove Confederate uh, monuments, often the image that's in your mind is uh, some community that loves and reveres its traditional uh, Confederate heroes, and there's these ideologically driven outsiders coming in trying to demand that they remove it. Actually, what happened in Charlottesville was the precise opposite of that. The city of Charlottesville, after a year-long public debate, chose, uh, in a close vote in the city council, chose to remove the Robert E. Lee statue, and I'll come back to that. Uh, it was a decision by the city of Charlottesville to remove that statue. It was the KKK and the neo-Nazis and other white supremacist groups who were the ideologically driven outsiders, descending from many parts of the United States upon the city of Charlottesville. Um, and uh, the, uh, the neo-Nazi leader Richard Spencer 
had an earlier demonstration in May of 2017 where he said in front of the statue, what brings us together is that we are white, that we are a people, that we will not be replaced. So the marchers were then chanting, you will not replace us. You will see this on that documentary. So there was no pretense about this being a matter of, quote, states' rights in some supposedly non-racial way. There was no pretense that it was principally about honoring the courage and sacrifice of Confederate soldiers. It was centrally about race. And so they were claiming their version of public history was that to remove this Confederate monument, to replace that monument was to replace us white people in the United States with people who look different from us. Um, I want to, I think the, the location of this event is really interesting, Charlottesville, Virginia. It's not clear that Robert E. Lee ever visited Charlottesville, um, even though there was a statue there. Uh, it, but Thomas Jefferson was Charlottesville is Thomas Jefferson's home. Monticello looks out over, over Charlottesville. He founded the University of Virginia, which was the site of many of these events. And so in a sense, uh, who was Thomas Jefferson? He was the author of the Declaration of Independence with the line, all men are created equal, that the abolitionists quoted very effectively. He was also a slaveholder. That Jefferson called slavery unjust and said it should eventually be abolished. But Jefferson also believed that the, after abolition, the races had to separate and advocated colonization of the freed slaves to some other part of the world. So in a sense, Thomas Jefferson represents both sides of our very divided, uh, contradictory American character. Uh, and uh, you will hear defenders of the Lee statue, leaving the Lee statue where it was. Why well, are we also going to tear down uh, statues of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington? Are we going to level Monticello? I don't believe in erasing the past. I also don't believe in taking down any monument of anyone who is not a perfect individual because then you wouldn't have monuments of anyone at all. But what I do recommend as a model is what is actually done at Monticello now, which is they're reconstructing the slave history um, of, of the, the slave families, the descendants of the slave families. This is also being done at Montpelier, which was James Madison's estate. So there are ways of doing public history where you don't erase figures from the past, but add new information and new context. And that was actually one of the options that the Charlottesville City Council had, rec had proposed or, or considered. Um, and there was, uh, well, I'm going to I'll come back to them. What is the U.S. Civil War about? The Civil, if you read the declarations of secession, it was about slavery. The South Carolina made clear that its grievances were that the northern states were not uh, fulfilling the, the Fugitive Slave Act, that northern states were allowing abolitionist societies to continue operating openly. They wanted those abolitionist societies suppressed. Um, so. Uh, and then uh, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, gave a speech called the Cornerstone Speech, where he said, the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, was a mistake. We are founding the Confederacy on the truth of racial hierarchy. That's what the, per that was the purpose of the Confederacy, to perpetuate s racial slavery in the United States. Robert E. Lee uh, was not a leader of that movement, but he did go along with his state, Virginia, when it seceded. So he became the, this very effective commander of the military force whose principal purpose was to uh, uh, perpetuate slavery in the United States. Um, Lee himself, after the Civil War, was w one of the few Confederate leaders that in that period was seen relatively positively by the North. And the reason was that he surrendered and did what he could after the war to try to unify the country. So that at a time when, in 1865 to 1870, he became a university president. Uh, he did not want people putting up monuments to the lost cause. He did not celebrate the lost cause the way that many other Confederate leaders did. So he acquired a kind of positive uh, image at that point that was different from Jefferson Davis or the others. By the 1890s, however, when segregation had come along big time, the historical na narrative had completely changed. There was this literally whitewashed version of the Civil War in which it 
was never about slavery at all because the slaves had all been happy and well treated. Uh, this was at also at the high point of lynchings in the United States, which were a way of, of of suppressing the 15th Amendment right to vote. And this was during the time period when the Charlottesville statue uh, came in, which was in it was commissioned in 1917, uh, went up in 1924. There was actually no inscription. It, it, it said Robert E. Lee. It gave the dates of his life. There was no explanation about him. It was as though the meaning of Robert E. Lee's life for the white South was so obvious that it did not need to be explained. So this is the illusion of consensus. You don't even need to say anything because we already know what we agree on. Um, so now to come back to Charlottesville in the present, Charlottesville today is a multiracial city. It's a university town. Its city council resolved on May 6, 2016, uh, set up a commission to quote, charged with, quote, telling the full story of Charlottesville his, Charlottesville's history of race and for changing the city's narrative through our public spaces. One of the options that was given to the, considered was, quote, relocating or adding context to existing Confederate statues. Another thing that they directed the commission to do was commission a new memorial or memorials to an African-American leader. The city ultimately voted by a close vote for removal rather than recontexting of the Robert E. Lee uh, statue. But the debate indicated some recognition, I think, of the complexity of the city's history. For the white supremacists who descended upon the city, there was no complexity. It was very simple from their point of view, us or them. So the final question of public history for Charlottesville will be what will be the public history of these events of August? They have to tell that story as well. And they're talking about that now. Even as we speak in Charlottesville, they're, they're talking about how to, how to retell that history. Because many people who may have never heard of Charlottesville before now know about Charlottesville. So my last slide is uh, some early uh, um, uh, suggestions about how to recontact that. Um, this statue is still up. We see Hire Memorial Park. Heather Hire was the young woman who was murdered with a car by one of the white supremacists. So th this uh, part of that event, uh, and the, the people of Charlottesville who, who came out in the streets to, to oppose this invasion of their city by white supremacists is going to be really central to how Charlottesville understands itself in the future. Thank you. I'm going to move um, in a slightly different direction and look at an event and an object that is a little closer to home, um, but is in many ways related to the uh, statues and public history that we've been looking at out of Charlottesville. Unlike the sculpture in Charlottesville, uh, the recently controversial sculpture that I'm going to be discussing uh, was not intended to become a monument in the same way as the Robert E. Lee statue, um, although its history also reaches back into the Civil War period. Um, and as I mentioned, it is closer to home. Uh, I will try to capture the various voices that were raised uh, around the construction of this sculpture and its subsequent um, dismantling. Uh, so it has that in common with Charlottesville as well. Sam Durant's scaffold was originally intended to raise awareness of and question the use of death penalty in the United States. So the artist had one particular vision, one particular story to tell. Um, he was invited originally to construct this for an international exhibition, Documenta, uh, which was held in Kassel, Germany in 2012. 
This sculpture scaffold is a representation of seven gallows used for execution at various points in US history. It was done to scale and it was uh, layering the decks on top of each other. It traveled to several locations in Europe where it was positively received and then it was purchased by the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis and was installed this past May um, as part of the newly renovated sculpture garden. But as it neared completion and the gallows were rising um, into the landscape, um, the, this instigated protests by the Dakota community. Um, the offensive section of this sculpture was a gallows, uh, represented a gallows used to execute execute 38 Dakota uh, in 1862. And the protesters demanded that this sculpture be removed and destroyed. They, amongst many other um, offenses that they noted, they also said that it was not art. So in addition to the use of public space, the, uh, uh, you know, who gets to tell the story, who gets to say what goes in the space, and these other questions, um, there's also an additional question here about what is art and who gets to decide that. Uh, counter protesters attacked the protesters and claimed the piece as a trophy. Okay, very disturbing um, result there. Um, there's, you know, less consensus in art as we're going to see, um, and and that's um, a, a part of the structure, um, the built-in structure. Um, of art versus public um, public art, which is a little different. So in this particular case, the artist thought his work was misunderstood initially when he heard about the protests and was certain that once everybody understood his intentions, all would be well. Um, to him, and I quote here, these things symbolize certain aspects of American history, class war, the genocide of Amer Native Americans, slavery. It looked at a state mon monopoly on violence, of which execution is the ultimate symbol, end quote. But he had to learn to see another perspective. Uh, he was reminded, as I tell my students all the time, context matters. <laughs> this gallows was in proximity to Mankato where the original gallows was constructed. It was constructed on land that was once Dakota land, but is now jointly maintained by the Walker Arts Center and um, Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board. Um, although Durant had done a, an enormous amount of historical and archival research, he hadn't reached out to those for whom history was still present. The most pertinent history related to this sculpture goes back to the time of the Civil War. In 1851, the Dakota, for those of you who don't know, signed a treaty um, that gave, forced them to give up most of their land and they were moved to a very small strip of land on which they could grow almost nothing. And by the winter of 1862, they were starving to death. And when they asked for aid, the local white authorities denied them. Um, eventually violence broke out and this led to uh, the US Dakota War during which uh, 303 Dakota warriors were captured. Um, white authorities sent a letter to President Lincoln and said, you know, we want to execute all 303. Um, President Lincoln reviewed each of the cases and commuted most of them, um, okaying only, um, approving only 39, sanctioning only 39 um, to, to be um, executed, but one was later released. So 38 were then hung at a gallows in Mankato on December 26th of 1862. This remains the largest scale mass execution in US history. This is an etching um, of the scene of the mass as execution. Durant's scaffold includes gallows from this mass execution. It also has a gallows from the, um, uh, for abolitionist John Brown, the Lincoln assassination conspirators, the Haymarket bombers, Rainey Bethia, Billy Bailey, and Saddam Hussein. In 2012, it was constructed, as I mentioned, for this international exhibition 
and traveled out throughout Europe and was well received. Durant had in anticipated a similar reception in the U.S. Um, he st stated in an interview, quote, by avoiding the representation of marginalized bodies, he had always believed he was skirting the risk of recalling historical trauma. Now, he says, he realizes that abstract symbols can be just as powerful as objective images. To the Native Americans today, um, this was not an abstract symbol. It is visceral. Uh, tribal historian Cheyenne St. John found the placement of such a tragedy-laden memory between a rooster and a spoon with a cherry to be extremely disrespectful, and stated, quote, these men fought in a war instigated by a series of broken treaty promises that led to starvation and death. We will always remember and honor these men. Or, as Ashley Fairbanks wrote in City Pages, no one should ever play putt-putt in the shadow of a gallows. No one should take a selfie with a tool of genocide, end quote. Perhaps the greatest shock was that no one had approached this community about this piece before it was installed. And both the uh, uh, artist and Walker Art Center have since agreed that this was an egregious error. The Dakota elder, elders agreed to meet with Olga Viso, the Walker Art Director, and a mediator to find a solution. Durant was also invited. And ultimately, it was mutually decided that the Dakota would dismantle mantle it, the metal pieces would be recycled, and the wood would be um, um, tr um, ceremonially treated and then buried in an undisclosed location. The National Coalition Against Censorship and others criticized this decision to move the, remove the sculpture. So um, saying that, that uh, this sets dangerous precedents for museums and for others. But the artist disagreed, saying that, quote, censorship is when a more powerful group or, or individual removes speech or images from a less powerful party. That isn't the case. The Dakota are certainly not more powerful in political terms or in terms of the international art world. I could have said at any point, no, I want the work to stay up as it is. End of story, Walker, you deal with it, end quote. Um, and in his statement addressing the Native community, the artist said something that I think um, resonates for um, many of us in recent days. Uh, quote, my work was created with the idea of creating a zone of discomfort for whites. Your protests have now created a zone of discomfort for me. I have learned something profound, and I thank you for that. Can this be a learning experience for all of us, the Walker and other institutions and artists and larger society, end quote. Some in the Native community are also hopeful about this um, um, opening of dialogue. Um, and at the same time, they had already been doing some community building and awareness raising of their own. In 2005, uh, they, it, due to a vision of one of their leaders, um, they started a ride that they do every year on, uh, that ends on December, December 26th in Mankato at Re Reconciliation Park. Um, in remembrance of the 38 plus two that were that went to their deaths on the on the gallows, and there's a wonderful movie about this. We have it in Alcorn Library. It's available online called The Dakota 38, um, that talks not only about the history but also about this event, this memory commemorative event that occurs every year where they ride 300 miles, um, ending in Mankato. So uh, there was already this happening, and and Durant and and the um, Walker, we're not aware of that happening in a different public space. Um, it's a different kind of commemoration than a statue or a scaffold, much like some of the African American commemorations uh, that Shannon discussed at the beginning. So in the end, Durant's piece was a memory become monument that becomes another memory. Reflecting on the decision to dismantle Scaffold, Viso, the director at Walker, said, we all feel moved to a place of mutual respect and consideration. The work still has power. It lives in the archives, in oral histories, and the actions of the people that live on, and we're part of this, end quote. But was it art? I'll leave you with that question.
A lot. That's my answer to Shakespeare's fav famous question, what's in a name? A lot. And maybe a rose by any other name would still smell as sweet. But what about a building, a park, or a street? I don't mean in terms of their smell, but I mean in terms of our experience of that thing and the way they shape our lives. What if we change the name of I-94 to I, Martin Luther King Jr.? as 900 other communities have done across the nation and internationally, or perhaps the Ilhan Omar Expressway after the first Somali-American Muslim to be elected to a state government, Chapman here in Minneapolis, would that change our experience of driving between the two campuses? Would that change who we believe ourselves to be and how we can imagine our future? My answer is yes. The way we name our world both reflects our values and creates us as a people. In many ways, when we name our streets, our neighborhoods, our parks, our schools, our buildings, we are creating mini monuments to the past, which orient us then to a particular future. And as such, these names are really important, which is why I decided to talk about them today. In this short talk, I'll explore one of the main lessons that has come out of Charlottesville, which is that we care about monuments, right? and we care about mini monuments as well. And I'll try to uncover why it is that we are resistant to changing these names or these mini monuments, but at the same time, try to explain why I think it's necessary work. Unlike my colleagues who have talked about monuments in the capital M way, in, in statues and things, I'm gonna talk about a community's response to what happened in Charlottesville, as I believe it illustrates the fact that these mini monuments or names of places and things are quite resistant to change. They are not difficult to physically change as it would be to dismantle something like the Lee Monument in Charlottesville. Instead, they are rhetorically difficult to amend. Let me give you a little background about this case. After Charlottesville, the Oklahoma City public school officials, several of them, started to think about the names of their elementary schools. And they came to the conclusion that it's likely, more or less likely, that four of them are named after Confederate generals. So they decided to bring the question to the public. Should we change the name of these schools? As from what I can tell, the resounding answer has been no. And there's th three main reasons, it seems, that people wanted to keep these names. First, there's the appeal to tradition, right? This is what this, is, this has always been, right? And I like that. Leticia Brannon, one of the community members, said, I feel the name should stay. I went there when I was little, and that school is history to me. Second, there's the classic slippery slope, which suggests that renaming these, the schools that are named after Confederate soldiers will result in an endless cycle of renaming. In a news article, or in a comment to a news article, Pat Freeman states, I don't feel it's necessary to change names of anything. But if it happens, please name them after trees or something inanimate instead of human beings. A couple decades go by and some idiot will claim that they were a racist or a child molester or something, and the renaming will have to be done all over again, all over again. Learning from this, learning from this is that humans are flawed and schools and highways and other structures should never hold a human name, end quote. Third, and perhaps what I consider the most harmful defense of these names or keeping these names as is, is the idea that they are indeed harmless. They are just names. Maybe once, a while ago, they, they meant something about those people and those beliefs that we no longer support. But that was then and this is now. For example, the principal at Lee Elementary, 
said that the parents in the community, quote, very clearly stated they didn't want that name changed. Most of them don't care, he said. In other words, these names don't really mean anything, or they don't mean what they used to. The signifier has become detached from the signified. Most people don't know. And if they do, they don't really care. But as I have found in my own experiences, some people do care. And I think we all should as well. I want to give an example of something that happened to me in class last semester. I used to teach at the University of Georgia, and I taught a class in the rhetoric of civil rights, the memory of civil rights. And I asked students in class one day to research all of the names in their everyday lives, so the streets they drive on, the buildings they enter, the parks they go through a Frisbee at. What are these, you know, who were these people that we've named these places after? What they found was quite troubling. Two of the buildings most commonly frequented on campus, at least for me, were Caldwell Hall, where my department was housed, and Adderhold Hall were both named after the um, chancellor and the president during the desegregation era at the university. These two fought as hard as possible to keep African American students out and only relented when the court forced their hand. And one of the major streets on campus was named after a local slave owner. At the end of that class period, a young student of color came up to me with tears in his eyes and said, so how do I get home? How can I use these streets, go in these buildings, knowing what they represent? I didn't know how to respond. I certainly couldn't respond with those three reasons of, well, it's tradition. If we change, if we change those, we'll have to change everything all the time. Or is it really, does it really cause any harm? Does it really matter? I don't know what it's like to have to speak those names, give voice to names of people who consciously abuse my ancestors over and over and over just to get around. And so to conclude, I want to raise a couple questions. How do we proceed? We can make public memory both more accurate and more humane. We can tear down monuments that we don't like. We can create better museums that maybe tell a fuller story. We can write smarter textbooks. But what do we do about those everyday names, like good old Lake Calhoun, Caldwell Hall, Lee Elementary? Where do we start to address these issues, and when, if ever, can we stop? Perhaps should we, we should follow in old Shakespeare's lead and keep asking, what is in a name? Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. We have uh, about 20 minutes, so um, I don't know if we can get a little more light on the audience, and I can maybe bring this out and um, solicit questions for, for the panel. So if, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand, and I'll bring this to you. Thank you very much. This was a great panel. There are a lot. Of, <laughs> we could be here a lot longer than the 20 minutes. Uh, first, for those of you who've been here for a while, you might recall that we were going to name Escher Auditorium Petters Auditorium until Petters was found out to be a Ponzi scheme artist, and he's in jail now. So we've already changed something before we named it. Um, there's a big exhibit at the U right now about the about this very same thing, um, because some of the uh, administrators um, after whom several buildings on campus are named have uh, a, an, an unfortunate record uh, with respect to um, non-white students in the early part of the century. So the U's undergoing the same thing. Um, I guess a quick comment. Um, when we talk about public space and public memory, one of the things we often forget is that every generation, I think Shannon was mentioning this first, every generation gets to determine what it wants to remember and how it remembers that. And we have this false sense that history and interpretations are immutable. And we often don't realize that history is an interpretation and that 
the, those of us present now get to make the interpretation. So I think it would be helpful if we were able to rename things and take things down. Uh, I, I don't like the idea of destroying. Uh, that's why I'm still very uncomfortable with the scaffolding solution. I think that that was an unfortunate result. But, um, but I do think it's perfectly fair to say this is not what represents us right now. Um, but I just, here's my question after all the, those comments. Um, if, are, are we willing to say, per Jim's uh, talk, that we accept the Charlottesville City Council's decision to change, even in a close vote, but then we don't accept the town, I forget, uh, Nicole, which city it was, where the school, where the school district said the parents don't want to change the name. So in both cases, that's a presumably democratic decision to change or not to change. Do we have an obligation as a society to accept the results of both of those decisions? So I, 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 I guess that goes to me, right? And well, to at least yeah. I, I guess I would say that there, there would be some limits to. Uh, there would have to be some limits to what local decisions you'd accept, but my um, my inclination would be to not override a local decision unless you have a very strong reason. So I think in the case of the uh, the Oklahoma uh, schools. Uh, I would favor renaming them, but I, I don't think it, the, the renaming would mean as much unless it means more if it's done by that city or that school district than if it were directed from outside. Um, that's it. so. I, I, Charlottesville to me is is a uh, the city of Charlottesville is really a, a model of a serious process that could have gone a number of different directions, all of them actually better than what they had, than the status quo. And so I think the Charlottesville uh, process and deliberation was a good one. Um, I wouldn't say that every other city or every other school district when, can follow a process as good as that one, as responsible as that one was. Um, I would tend to leave this to the decision as much as possible, the decision of that local unit. Yeah, um, I would agree. I think uh, it's the community's choice or decision to create what type of community they they want to live in, um, as long as it was it as as long as it was a truly community effort. Um, with the Oklahoma City one, they. Um, we're going to take up the issue at their September 25th meeting, and I couldn't find the minutes for that, and no one has reported on it since. But leading up to it, like all all the you know news reports were that it, it probably wasn't going to go forward. Um, and so, yeah, I guess if it happened through you know true democratic deliberation and a lot of voices were heard, um, and that was the decision they came to, this is what we want. This is what we want our community to be. Then, then I guess that would have to be fine. Yeah. Um, I would just complicate this a little bit because we have to think about who is the local and how are people actually represented and what is a true democratic process if not everybody gets to vote equally, if not everybody gets a true say, or if 48% say, I am actually offended by <laughs> driving down the street or going to the school, and the rest of you don't care at all. Mm -hmm. Like That doesn't seem like democracy at work either. I will also say that there are some local decisions where the states, this I find fascinating in the South, in which some would still argue that the war was about states' rights, which it was not, unless it's states' rights to have slavery. But states' rights, trumping local rights. So there are many Southern states that have laws on the books that say it requires uh, state legislative approval to remove any statue over 40 years old. So the city of Memphis has voted for ages. They want to get rid of a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, 
the state is prohibiting them from doing that, even though it went up during the backlash against the civil rights movement. So here is the state then imposing on the local and defying a local decision. Um, and I, I would just add that the statuary hall, things move very slowly and it's very limited and up until 2000, there is no mechanism to remove any statues. Um, so in the 90s, uh, mostly in the 90s, there were um, several things commissioned, a, a bus, uh, like a bust of Martin Luther King Jr. and a statue of Rosa Parks that are now in the same spaces. But unfortunately, as we all know, um, it's, there's no such thing as separate and equal, right? So um, I'm, I'm glad to see there's been some movement, but it does take time. So um, I'd love to get another question or comment. Hello, this is Aditya from India. Uh, I find the discussion quite fascinating because we have the same kind of discussion going on in India about the colonial history of British India, whether we should have cities named after governor generals, our streets after, uh, you know, many bloody, uh, you know, generals who like killed many people. So I just want to ask that why you are having this discussion so late in your, you know, in your uh, in your, uh, you know, in your cultural thing, you know, because you could have, why does the av average American feel that this discussion should happen like in the 2000s? Why didn't it happen like in 90s? When we see that this is a progressive nation. So shouldn't this discussion look, could have like happened more than uh, like 20, 30 years before then it did happen in India? Because India had the discussion like about 15 to 20 years ago that why should we have uh, monuments after, you know, horrific rulers like Aurangzeb, many uh, horrific rulers of past. So my question is that why uh, is this discussion happening after such a sad incident? Why didn't this discussion happen before? Second question is about, you know, there were many perspectives about how, how you can, you know, have this monuments at large. You can also have this monument and you can also have a notice there that this is the shameful history of our nation. This is the shameful history that what we did to our people, that how universal adult franchise that was given to India in 1968 was also, uh, sorry, uh, so, so in 1952 was not available to the average American who was li in, living inside in uh, America. He, he was, uh, an average American was given universal adult franchise in 1968 if you consider what is universal in nature. So you can also use those monuments as a, uh, as a symbol of, you know, shame so that you can also also make people understand your future generation that this should not happen that we should not come there should not come a time and we will again have a monument like this we will never have an incident like this so on these two questions do you have any perspective so um i think some in certain ways these discussions have been going on for a while but they're usually local and don't get the uh, the sort of play that a cup that the event driven ones have. So I think um, uh, one of the panelists mentioned that in Memphis it's been a long time. So there have there have been discussions on local levels. Some of the awful events that have driven national discussions. One of them was this white supremacist Dylan Roof's a murder of attendees in a in a black church in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, he deliberately did this as an act of Confederate flag waving. So that drove, that hor horrendous event drove a reconsideration of, of Confederate monuments in many parts of the United States. But at the same time, unfortunately, also stoked up the other side in a way that they hadn't been before. So, um, um, yeah, the national events can 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 bring focus on this, but they also can polarize in a way that that local discussions are not always so polarized. I would also add social media to the mix. 
Um, just that I know that in the case that I talked about, the artist was really disturbed about how social media was twisting a lot of what was happening in that particular event. Um, and, you know, it's really only in the 2000s that that's been a big player here um, where that message can get out quickly and people can mobilize and get places because the message has got out quickly. Um, so that might be a part of it, maybe. Um, I don't know others. I could go to town on this for a long time. So um, I, I, this is a fantastic question. Yes, what's taken so long? Um, I would say, first of all, many of the commemorate, like many of the Confederate monuments that went up uh, were during the Jim Crow era as a way of reasserting white supremacy. And at another moment in which there could have been a reconsideration during the civil rights movement, most local communities doubled down and added more. So a lot of the naming practices, a lot of the additional monuments were added during the 1950s and 60s as part of massive resistance against civil rights. So it, it actually was re and reasserting white supremacy in these spaces. Uh, and I would go back to the earlier thought about who controls all of this, even now, who is on the local city council? If it is a predominantly African American or very diverse town, and most of the city council members are white, then you're gonna get often more of the same, not always. Um, I love your language of using this as a symbol of shame. I'd love to discuss more about counter monuments or plaques or reinterpretation. Uh, from my perspective, if there's a 60 foot tall monument to Robert E. Lee, unless there is a 60 foot tall sign that says this man fought to maintain slavery, it's not going to really capture the same attention. So uh, how that is articulated, I think plaques, I mean, people jogging in parks are not stopping to read plaques that say, this was bad. So uh, there, there are great movements and great ways of doing that. I think they have a hard time capturing the same power that these monuments already hold in space. I do like the solution. I believe it was in Romania um, where they took the statues down and left the plinths up, right? So then a viewer is, you know, these empty spaces can be quite powerful and the viewer has to then ask what was there, right? And learn um, um, and that, is a marker of shame, so they leave that as a as a marker. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. We can comment that uh, occurred to me that sometimes these things are, are framed as, as though they're freedom of speech issues. And I think that's a misunderstanding of the difference between a public monument and a private uh, act. Somebody has a First Amendment right to, to fly a Confederate flag in their yard on their truck. I, I'm offended by it, but. They do have a right to do that. That's totally different from a state legislative hall or a or a uh, public park or a public cemetery, because in that case, it is supposed to be the public that is speaking, and the public speaking has a right to choose and to and to change its mind about what that public statement is going to be. So, uh, I, I think of this because many of the the uh, white supremacists who marched there, we're, we're talking about freedom of speech, this being a freedom of speech issue. Uh, these are the people that would muzzle their opponents if they have the first opportunity. It's not about freedom of speech, it's about pu public, public spaces, public displays are always uh, supposed to be more than just an individual's view.
Good. Well, um, on that note, we will be having another of these events a week from tonight, as, as Mary Geller mentioned. Uh, fake news and echo chambers, how can we stop the spiral? And that's uh, October 11th at 4.30 in Gretzky, 204B. So again, thank you all for being here. It was, it was really um, a pleasure to, to be part of this panel.